Review the Fat will give you our gut reactions on all things pop culture, film, TV and theatre. We talk to legends in the creative industry and those on the rise. We gain old school. We do all of this, this, this and a whole lot more. Like, subscribe and get involved. Join Lance Dean, Anthony Nielsen and the Outcast Creative. Right, well, let me get my mic a bit closer. Just realised it's a bit far away. Uh, we've got a pretty packed out show for you tonight. I have a feeling the discussion is going to get quite heated, whereas it's uh, it's been quite united uh, up until now. Uh, I think it's going to get quite, quite heated uh, this evening. Uh, possibly we shall see uh i've got a great panel lined up of course uh and uh i'm looking forward to very much hearing their thoughts we're going to be keeping to the the usual format uh for those people just tuning in i'm going to tell you about a couple of things we've got coming up and i'm going to recap those again at the end of the show so don't forget this saturday at nine o'clock We've got an absolutely brilliant um, industry interview with Damon Herriman. If you're a big fan of the TV show In Between, and if you aren't, you should be, because it's one of the best things ever made for television, um, I suggest you check it out. If you haven't seen it, it's on the Disney Channel. Uh, Damon Herriman is one of the main cast from Mr. In Between, but he's also been on Justified. He's been on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, I've been following his career for a really, really long time. Looking forward very much to uh, chatting with him on Friday. Then on Sunday, we have the first of 11 Band of Brothers specials. We'll be covering every episode of the original series. Uh, but in addition to that, we're also going to be talking about one of the episodes which was uh, never made, but had a full script, was originally part of the production, uh, but was dropped uh, just as uh, shooting began. Uh, we're going to be going through that script. We're going to be doing a breakdown of that script that you've never seen, which is called Personal Effects. We're going to have loads of behind-the-scenes photos, most of which have never been publicly released before, um, including this one of uh, some of the guys on set. Uh, so we'll be getting all deep into Band of Brothers from Sunday, every Sunday, uh, at eight o'clock, slightly different panel lineup for that one, uh, but it's going to be really good. We're going to be doing that for 11 weeks, 11 weeks. Uh, there is going to be something taking the place of Shogun, uh, but I'm going to be doing a couple of one-off specials first, and uh, then we're going to be getting into some new stuff. Band of Brothers, the lost episode. Indeed, the episode is called Personal Effects. It's about them trying to identify a dead paratrooper, and the whole episode is actually about that and about the Grave Diggers unit, but it was uh, effectively dropped because it didn't fit in uh, with the rest. Anyway, without any further ado, let me uh, start to bring in the entourage uh, for Shogun. First, all the way up beyond the wall during the winds of winter, we have the Northern English Bastard. Evening, you lot. How are you lot doing anyway? <clears throat> I'm doing fine, mate. How are you? Yeah, yeah, just been putting uh, together my Fallout TV video and uh yeah we'll continue that tomorrow it's kind of been a bit exhausting i've had a uh, lot to do today as well so yeah let's uh did, you enjoy, did, you, did yeah. you enjoy fallout yeah i enjoyed most of it it has its problems but uh apart from that it's i am looking forward to the second season and i do like uh yeah. the lead character as well she's uh she's very it was fun, good it? It, was, it was fun it was fun yeah I won't be yeah. on here too long, though, because I've got another stream at 11 with uh, Emperor J. Goodwin. We'll, we'll be discussing mm -hmm. Dead Men Don't Wear Plates, so that should be a good laugh. You've only got uh, 55 minutes then, so I'd better get the rest of the yeah. panel in. Uh, so <laughs> let's uh, let's zoom on. Next up is Darth Plato. How's it going? How's it going, sir? Hey, man. Nice to have you on. Thanks for having me. I can't wait to hear what Lance had to think about the, uh, the production and the acting and everything else. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm glad to hear, unlike last week where you had perfect sound, it's, it's, it's good that the continuity of your bad audio is back. Uh, otherwise, people would wonder what was going on. Uh, fantastic. Uh, we also have, uh, all the way from the Wild West, Leroy in the house. What's up, fellas? How's it going, buddy? I'm um, good. I'm good. 
good, good, good to see you. Uh, last but by no means least, mm -hmm. Lucola Luza. How just, are you, sir? I just finished the still, so we're good to go. Okay, fantastic or phantasmagorical, as uh, some <laughs> people say occasionally. Um, well, okay, ah, Shogun episode 10. Mm. Uh, lots to lots to talk about. Let's just do a quick round through the chat. We've got uh, Drew Gordon, spoilers. Uh, he's getting into talk about Andor and stuff. We won't focus on that now. Uh, <laughs> Professor R2 is in the house. Well, Toxic is here. Dan Candy is here. Um, yeah, there's uh, Keith E is here as well. Uh, so Retro Nerd Girl, yeah, we love her. She's awesome. Um, and then we also have John Travolta in the house. Good to see you again, sir. Vincent Vega. Um, so uh, Jamma Lama is here. Uh, I don't know what that says, but uh, it's up to interpretation. And uh, yeah, okay. Well, let's get let's get cracking. We've got twelve people already. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe if you can do a little post and share the stream. I'd really appreciate it. That also goes for my guests. Get on the case if you haven't done one already. Uh, all right. So I'm going to talk through the. Uh, break down as fast as I can. We'll do the usual thing. And then Northern Bastard, because you've got to go early, uh, we'll, we'll be doing you first, okay? Um, to hear your, hear your thoughts. So I don't want anyone to give final ratings yet. I don't want anyone in the chat to give uh, ratings yet out of 10. Uh, we're going to do a rating for the... Sh when we do do ratings, we're going to do a rating for this episode and then a rating for the series overall now that the series is done this is a one-off series it's not getting a sequel um at least that's what we've been told and i wouldn't expect there to be because it is just the one book so um let's get into it so pre-titles we've got a flashback sequence where we flash back to blackthorn and Jin. he's kind of on his deathbed uh he has his swords hung up nearby there's a shogun's uh, helmet uh hung up nearby um and uh, his two sons are sort of coming in and disturbing him. And it, 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 he's kind of breathing very heavily. Uh, and uh, it's difficult to tell whether that scene takes place in England or whether that scene takes place in Japan. My personal view is that the impression is given that it takes place in England because the children are not mixed race children and the design of the house is quite European. Um uh, Darth, do you have a view on that before I continue? Uh, yeah, I think that that's actually a nightmare. I don't think he's, he's nightmaring about going back to Europe. He doesn't want to go back to Europe. We, that should have been obvious with his interaction with his men. Yeah. And, and I think the biggest giveaway is uh, he's holding the uh, the crucifix that he throws away later in the lake. So yeah. he, he's, 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 he wants to avert that future. I guess, I guess that future himself, I guess, is like... Uh, I don't know, maybe it's like Christopher Pike in that one Star Trek episode where he's messed up yeah. in a wheelchair. He wants to yeah, he, yeah, he yeah. wants to avoid something like that. Yeah. But it but it could be that that um he was uh it could be that during that time he, he he yeah, he's dreaming that he's in England. So in in the context of the dream, it is in England, but is it real or is it a nightmare? Uh yeah, I think you're right. I think it's a it's a, it's, and it's a I think nightmare. those boys were his grandkids, from what I remember. They did say, uh, they did say yeah. grandfather. Yeah, that's right. They do call him grandfather. Sorry. So let's let's continue. I'm sure I'm going to get slacked off for that. Uh, forgive me anything that I uh, get incorrect in my notes. I do my best, but my memory is terrible. Okay, so Yabushi wakes him up from his slumber. Um, he cradles uh, Blackthorn soon, or Anjin. I'll probably call him Anjin for the rest of the stream. Uh, cradles uh, Mariko, but unfortunately she is dead. Uh, Yabushi at this point knows he's fucked up. He's saying out loud, forgive me. And we can kind of see that he's losing his marbles a bit. Now, this is uh, the aftermath of the attack by the Shinobi. So we get into the uh, opening titles after that. Toranaga is at the lake. Uh, a bird arrives with a message. Um, in Osaka, all the royal households are now leaving the, ca the castle. So there they are leaving the castle on screen. Um so, and of course, I think that one of the things that I don't think we said on the stream last week um, when we were talking about Crimson Sky is somebody uh, said this to me and I thought, of course, it's so obvious. But, you know, 
Mariko was the Crimson Sky. She was it. <laughs> she was the, the, the deadliest weapon that he could unleash into that castle with her message, which challenged um, uh, Shido's authority, um, undermined it. And then, of course, she was attacked, which backfired. And, of course, that led to, quite justifiably, all the royal households leaving Osaka Castle because they could say that it was no longer safe. The council meets, that's discussed in the council meeting, which is what's happening on screen now. A letter from, uh, from Toronaga arrives, delivered by his brother. He has left the city of Edo and is now preparing for war in secret. We can tell from the expressions on various characters' faces that it's clear the council is now divided. Mm -hmm. But Lord Ashido, he pushes for war, claiming it will have a legal president because he will have the blessing of the of the heir apparent, the child king, if you like. Um, uh, and he's dismissive about how Mariko will be honoured. Um, and Lady Oshiba says... Uh, Lady Mariko will be generously honoured. Mm. Um, and she's quite adamant about that. Now, I loved that. That moment, however, is severely undermined later in the show because we don't see Mariko's funeral at all. And I'm going to come back to that. It's one of my gripes. And I've got more than one. Um, <laughs> so, I'm just, uh, so I'm just making a note of that. Gripe number one. Okay. Um, again, I do like the show. I'm not here to bash the show. We're just going to talk through it. And I'm going to... Mm going to give it some what i think is valid criticism um ashido and yabushi meet in secret it's revealed that he was offered a seat on the council for his portrayal uh yabushi talks of old tales and of a, a, a and of a time when another lord delayed declaring war because of an earthquake uh, ashido orders him back to izu to gather his army and to await orders from him for the final battle etc uh, etc cetera, etc cetera, et cetera. um uh, sorry, so let me just uh, close my Facebook, otherwise it's going to be bing-bonging at me all night. Um, Toranaga is with his falcon, falcon and eagle, or slash eagle. I'm not sure which it is. I think it's a falcon. I think. It's a yeah. falcon. Yeah, falcon. Um, and it, there's kind of a this message here. I return you to the sky. Bear many daughters. This is all very heavy symbolism hmm. to mark Mariko's death, but it also suggests a potential rebirth in his head that, Maybe, you know, in his head, she's gone on to have a, a greater life. But that's the way I saw it. This no. sky shot of Osaka, I thought this uh, shot was the bollocks. Uh, for those Americans that don't understand what that means, that means great. It was excellent. Um, and then uh, Anjin, again, is kind of in a semi-state of dreaming. He's um, only to discover that he's missed the burial of uh, Mariko. Um yeah. And uh, in brackets, I've put what a shame because this was a very powerful scene in the 1980 version. And I'm going to come back to that. The priest turns up, escorts him to the ship. Anjin realizes his plan, um, as in Toranaga's plan, got him what he wanted. Um, the priest reveals Mariko came to him for absolution uh, the night before her death. The plan was to have Anjin killed. Um, in the woods on the way to the harbour, but the priest tells him that a different arrangement was made and he's uh, escorted safely to his ship. Uh, go with God, Anjan San. Um, and uh, yeah. the priest refers to Mariko as Lady Maria uh, and says that she had made an arrangement with the church to spare his life. Anjan is then seen crying on the bed. Note that he's also had a trusty haircut at some point <laughs> uh, from waking up and going to the boat. Um, uh, so um, we then cut to the palace. Lady Oshiba and the son are talking about the poem with the leafless branch, and she's saying we must finish the poem, and he says, does, does a branch not also bear leaves and fruit, etc., etc.? Um, Anjin eventually arrives back at the village only to see his burnt shell of a boat coming into view, which uh, Yashubi had kind of suggested they could maybe sail away and escape on a, a, the, the act of a desperate man, I call that. On landing, Yabushi is immediately arrested by his nephew. Um, the old man tells Anjin that Christians burned his boat and the village people are being arrested. We soon see that several of them have been beheaded. I think there's probably a shock. Yeah, there we go. That reminded me of... Um, 
that that reminded me of uh, the Walking Dead that that shot. Yeah. And now I, I had a question about that. Are any of those heads? Are any of those heads even minor characters that we've met? Because I, I remember. No, I didn't. I didn't think so. One of them looks like a buddy from my War Games club, but uh, I don't think that's intentional. Okay, yeah. so um, Yabushi's brought brought before Torinaga. His re his betrayal's been reported by Omi, who saw him let the uh, shinobi into the castle. Yeah. Uh, basically, Torinaga says seppuku by sunset tomorrow. So it's um, it's all uh, you know, um, uh, yeah. His his fate is kind of uh, secured. Um, he asks for uh, Anjin to be his second. Torinaga refuses this. So then he asks Torinaga to be his second. Torinaga agrees. Anjin re returns home. Kiku attempts to uh, momentarily comfort him, uh, having recovered Fuji, from Fuji, her own... Kiku. It's Fuji. Oh, Fuji. Sorry. Yeah, not Kiku. Yeah. Fuji, uh, Kiku's the... Um... Is the whore. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. Fuji. Thank you for correcting me. Please do if I uh, make any errors. And uh, again, just remember, for those people watching at home, my brain don't work too good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. So, Tor I'm quite happy to uh, fess up to that. Uh, Toranaga is finally able to see his new son um, because, Thank of you, course, uh, and, and uh, a secret message has been delivered from Lady Ochiba. Uh, Toranaga asks the woman who uh, delivers it, Has she read it? And she, uh, I love that moment. She replies with a not entirely sincere face and says, What a yeah. suggestion! What a suggestion, my lord. Uh, That's the, letter, right. the letter's in the form of a poem, uh, yeah. possibly containing the last words of uh, Mariko, possibly code for more, question mark. Um, so Anjin and um, Fuji, uh, I'm correcting myself here, uh, Toranaga has, uh, they have a scene where she uh, tells him Toranaga's informed her um, that she can go and join a convent. Anjin requests and then demands for her to stay because he obviously feels close to her now and there is no one else. He says, it's impossible. I'm no longer your consort. Um, Anjin says, but what if I give you a jelly donut? She says, it's still impossible. Um, and uh, then he relents and expresses his uh, desire for her to become the best nun uh, possible. His last request of her is to inform Toranaga he wishes to have a meeting. So he's taken to see Toranaga at a rather lovely Vista location. Credit to the location manager. What a great yeah. location. No CGI here. This is a this is a real location. This is a real shot. Um, I really liked that. I liked it. One of my favorite uh, moments in the episode, actually, just because it's just, you know, it's very obviously a real good location that someone Saul still, we're not in a green room, uh, mm. you know, with CGI backdrop. Um, the old man, uh, whose real name I think is Mirajai, Miraji, I might be pronouncing that incorrectly, um, reveals himself to be the secret agent of Toranaga, planted in the village many moons ago to keep an eye on his um, enemies. He's actually samurai, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He's yeah. And then, then um, Anjin says, well, at least you're not a Catholic. But unfortunately, that proves not to be the case. Um, so um, Anjin uh, requests that Toranaga leaves the village alone um, and says that Mariko made an, made an arrangement to have the ship destroyed in order to save her, her um, his life. That This all feels very different from the book, incidentally, and we'll, I guess we'll comment on that in a bit. Um Anjin then offers his life for the village when Toranaga refuses to spare the village and attempts to kill himself. But Toranaga stops him and asks him instead to effectively become his naval lieutenant and help him build a fleet of ships. The village is forgiven. So we see the uh, decapitated heads being uh, taken away, um, <clears throat> put on Northern Bastard's uh, shelf for decorative use. Um, <laughs> Yabushi goes with his son to commit Serpaku. There's like a death poem. There's quite, quite a moving scene between him and his nephew. The nephew says, I've learned so much from you. And he says, well, now the learning ends. Um, Yabushi and Toranaga talk. And it's at this point that Toranaga actually admits to burning um, Anjin's ship. He explains his whole plan. This scene was very much like, 
Mr. Bond, let me show you around my uh, evil base and explain my plan. Uh, it was a little bit like that, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, and uh, again, there are some differences uh, with the book here about what Soren Arga did and didn't do. Um, he also then explains that the Hare and Ochiba have, uh, will side with him when it comes to the big battle. So uh, what will happen is Ashido will find himself uh, on the battlefield um, with none of the other council coming to his aid and um, be fighting himself, uh, well, fighting with an army on his own. It was at this point that I got quite excited because we cut to a shot of a big army. Here it is. And this is the last time we see Ashido in the episode, that shot. That yeah. Just up. Uh, I have a big problem with that, which I'm going to come back to. That's, uh, that's my... I can guess what it is. I agree. Second, I don't agree with that. I don't. Uh, uh, that's my second main gripe, and it's not its not that we don't have a battle. It's that that's, that's, that's all we get for, for the finality of Ashido. Sorry, but that's not good enough. Um, anyway, we'll, 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 come, we'll come back to that. So um, then um, Anjin and Kiku, uh, uh, they go, not sorry, not Kiku, Anjin and, and, yeah, thank you. They go out uh, to sea and because Anjin suggests committing the husband and the children to the sea yeah. so that they might live on forever in the afterlife because that's a bit of an English seaman tradition. And um, and it's quite a beautiful moment, actually. That that was a really beautiful scene. I, I liked that. Uh, then we cut back to the village, and Anjin and his uh, fellow villagers are trying to raise his ship out of the water, drag it in so they can salvage what they can and rebuild the Hulk. Um, Mariko's husband turns up and uh, decides to help. Here he is on screen now, and they begin to raise the ship together. I thought that was very symbolic. It was very powerful. Sort of, you know, them putting their past kind of conflicts behind them for the sake of the me memory of the woman they both loved, and um, you know, it was good. And I, and I, it was at this point that I realised, shit, we're not going to get a big battle in this uh, episode. Are we? Yeah. This is this battle. This battle is not going to happen. Yeah. Um, we're, we're going to have a climactic ending of a wreck of a ship coming up on the beach. Um, and we cut to Toronaga and he's looking on meaningfully and, uh, you know, there's some words spoken and mm -hmm. yeah. And then it's the end. Ah, <sighs> Shogun, 10 episodes. Okay. So, um, I've got some issues with this episode. I have to say that I thought the ending of this was pretty weak. Um, it has got some really good stuff and I don't think it was so bad that it undermined the show as a whole to make the show as a whole failure but i was disappointed now i don't know if it's that they ran out of money or um that you know they were limited on what they could film because there was covid and you probably couldn't do scenes with 500 extras when you got covid because you know you only need one of those extras to get covid and <laughs> then that's it you, you know you can't shoot for that day so um so it was shot in a difficult time so so i get why but nevertheless I still think, even with those restrictions, the one thing that we should have seen, even if it was in close-up with loads of shouts of, and cries and the battle going on around them, I think we should have seen Torinaga and Ashido face it off on the battlefield and he should yeah. have killed him. He should have executed him. Or, or he should have been dragged away in chains, whatever the, the ending is in the book. Yeah. I, I just Him having a speech... And then cutting to a shot of Shido um, looking thoughtful is not enough of an ending after everything you've put us through the last nine episodes, which has been very good, very well made show. That is not a satisfactory ending. Some bloke talking about the plan that's going to happen, but we're not actually even seeing it in the present tense. It's still only something that may happen. Um, so I just... Um, thought you know what that's that's not enough um i kind of knew we probably weren't going to get the big battle i had a feeling about that last episode but i i, I still think you could have minimized the big battle in the background it could have been mostly cg but you could have done a foreground thing with about 20 extras the two guys fighting it out 
um, like Warriors and Torinaga showing his skill on the battlefield and taking the guy out. Um, I, and that would have been possible to do. That's what I wanted to see, and we didn't get it. Um, uh, uh, that and a couple of other things, kind of not not having Mariko's funeral, I thought we definitely should have seen that. Um, it was a very, very powerful moment in the original show. And even if they didn't want to necessarily copy everything the original show did, so what? This is a major character. She's had a death. Her funeral is a big event. Um, Darth will, will tell us about some mm. of the differences in a minute. So, Northern, you're going to go first, mate. Dive in. Yeah, I really do agree because we've had so much build-up, right? And uh, it's basically just this five minutes of him uh, monologuing what's going to happen and nothing. And... Uh, even though she's kind of veering away from the book, um, this, yeah, the battle was probably not in the book because we, it was seen through Blackthorn's point of view. But since this was veering a bit more off the book with uh, seeing more of the Japanese uh, view, we should have had that battle. It was building so much. There was all this backstabbing, all these like uh, meetings, all this, uh, all this power grab and uh, all for nothing. All for nothing. We don't even get Mariko's funeral scene. We don't even get because in the in the original, Blackthorn was blinded from the accident, and uh, even though he couldn't oh, yeah. see the funeral of Mariko being sent off, he could still he still sensed that loss, and he could still see how much it was killing in him. And it was a uh, very powerful, and it's so rushed. Everything feels so rushed, and uh, despite Yabu Buntoro being improved from the original, in my opinion. This was such a letdown, and it really does lower the series in, in in general. Yeah, I thought the final episode of the original series was better, I will admit. Yeah, it's the same yeah. ending as the original. Uh, the Great Battle is uh, spelled out through exposition. You don't see it, and that's it. Anticlimactic. Yeah. Yeah, it was... Uh, it was I mean, what you've got is... You, you, I think... I don't want to uh, take up too much more time, but the, the things that we have over the other show is I think the cast overall in this show are much, much stronger. And that's partly just to do with the fact like we know a lot more about acting um, as a skill set um, in the business now than we did back then. We know a lot more about cinematography. We know a lot more about costume design. We know how to achieve um certain things that, that you couldn't achieve back then um so the show has a lot going for it it's just a shame that this last episode just didn't really deliver for me it's still a good show i probably will still buy the blu-ray box set when it comes out looks beautiful dialogue's great acting's great all the acting oh, in this yeah that was, that's great. The, that was the only thing that kind of made me uh sit through it was the acting just the way they play the scenes out and the got a super yeah, chat it's, here it's kind of bothering me it really has you can you can carry on in a sec uh 2024 shogun finale was much like something sneaking away in shame after a wet fart um, <laughs> once agree. Again, the 1980s series was much better and the book of course is supreme uh the book's always better um yeah i mean luca uh, um uh what else have you got to add I don't think there is much else to add, really, because um, apart from, I do agree that Buntaro sort of putting his differences aside was very, was actually very emotional, and uh, we do see uh, what's uh, what's the actor's name, Corey Corey Jarv Cosmo Jarvis, really mm -hmm. acting his ass off, and he you really he really does make you feel the pain he's going through. But mm. yeah, uh, after time, it's just made me want to just appreciate the uh, original mark despite the facts there was a lot of exposition be with with nothing being shown in that one well one of the funny things is the most one of the most googled things at the moment is will there be a season two of shogun i did it uh, yeah and the, one, the second thing is who won the end battle at the <laughs> end of shogun so even though people have seen this they still don't they, they, because we don't see him win, so we don't know if he did win. We just see him saying, I'm going to win because, and these are the reasons why. Yeah. And it then, should have been an hour and a half. I mean, uh, have the, yeah, uh, I've, I've, an hour, then, I've an hour, half an hour with the battle, and uh, 
we uh, see a little bit of what happened to Taranaga after the battle, after he wins, and uh, how does he, uh, and like maybe he conquers uh, Jap- the whole of Japan and does he become more of a tyrant, or does he become an, uh, a good leader? Who knows? We could have yeah. seen a bit more like that. Yeah, it, that would that would have been that would have been much more satisfactory. I would have liked to have had a. I would have liked to have had even again if we couldn't see the battle. I would have liked to command tent scene where you know Lord Ashido is arriving on the battlefield looking confident. Cut to shots of his ma- massive CGI army. Even if it was average CGI, fine. But um, you know, have some guy running come running in. Councilman so and so is not coming. It's a bit like that scene in Braveheart, mm-hmm. you know, the second battlefield where the the commanders come yeah. running up and say, um, "Or oh, three hundred, you know, right at the end of three hundred. Yeah, the lords aren't coming, you know, and and you could gradually see the the, the blood drain from Ashido's face as he realizes he's in deep deep shit. Um, I think there was definitely an opportunity uh, left there. Uh, Tony K. Uh, any relation to the singer? Uh, I'll stick to the 80s miniseries. Thank you. Uh, there is no second season, guys. I'm just going to tell you now. Jamalama thinks there is, that there's no second season coming. No one was contracted for a second season. There's no plan to do a second season. Um, I mean, they could, and it uh, they could diverge from the book even more because there, there isn't one. But, um, yeah, so, uh, okay. Uh, all right, Northern, thank you for your thoughts. Uh, thoughts on that um darth your your turn buddy um i can't really add anything to anything more than just said i think it, it, it showing about it would have been anticlimactic i agree with that uh i'll add a part about uh, the scene with buntro though buntro's helping blackthorn at the end because he wants blackthorn to build his ship as quickly as possible they can get the hell out of it you know, england's that way that's what he wants you know what? Um, I'm still a prick. <laughs> okay. You you pointed out several differences, Darth, um, with the final episode in the book. Do you want to just highlight some of those for us? Yeah. Um, um, well, off the top of my head, the uh, the absence of the of the funeral just is ridiculous. It's uh, I I don't know. What to say about that? I'll leave that to you. Um, what I'll say that I don't think you're going to catch on is um, the burning of the ship has a dual purpose. When the ship burned, 54 men were executed, and that's what we see in, in the episode. But the way this episode plays it out is not at all how it happens in the book. I don't, I don't know exactly what they were thinking when they did this episode. I really don't. But it is what it is. What I'm going to add is that Yabu had his own plan for becoming Shogun. The 1980 series and the 2024 series doesn't address it at all. It is in the book, though. You want me to tell you what Yabu's plan was? Please. Does a, does a bear yeah. shit in the woods? Of course we do. Okay. Yabu's plan was to have Toranaga and his sons assassinated while during the Battle of Sekigahara. So that he would be the last man standing. Hey, how about that? And then he could just, and then he could finish off Ashida. The number of men that he allotted to, to to fulfill this task was fifty-four men. Right. Right. So, are you making, uh, that, are you making that connection? Yeah. Okay. So, in case anyone's not, the fifty-four men who were executed on the burning of that ship. Were the same men who were gonna who were gonna do the deed during the battle, and Toranaga knew about that because Omi told him the plan. Right. So Omi, okay. Omi ratted him out. Oh, okay. So because the nephew ratted him out, uh, Toranaga knew exactly who to execute in the village and the. That's right. And That's the, right. Those, those people were basically actually all the traitors. On the other hand. The boat was was it was burned for another reason, because Toronaga made a separate agreement with Kiyama to withdraw from the coming battle. It was no longer necessary to send Blackthorn south with the Erasmus to attack the black ship in the south. 
lockdown. Okay. Yeah, I thought I feel like I want to go and read the book now, and um, that's not. I, it, it's, it's only it's only 1,200 pages. Man. Yeah, only only 1,200. Yeah, what else did I say here? Uh, and and that you know what that book used to be everywhere in secondhand bookshops. It was always in jumble sales. No, because everybody read it, and everybody like passed it on, or like you do with old books, you often get rid of them. You have to chuck them out eventually. There's not enough space. And I used to see, I used to see it everywhere. I used to see that and whirlwind at boot sales and all of that. And uh, now I haven't seen him. I haven't seen him anywhere for ages. Yes, yes, I still have my copy. I I've been rereading some of the la the latter chapters. The latter chapters are the ones that are really the most heavy. Yeah, the last would, eleven chapters. It would be good to. Um, it would be go. It would be good if they did an adaptation of James Clavell's whirlwind novel because that's. Yeah. That's an interesting political historical backdrop, much more modern, of course. And one more really big difference in how this was how this all played out compared to the original. Fujiko or Fuji, yeah, does die. She does not live. Oh, she dies? Yes. What what happens to her? Um Toronaga, she requested to die from Toronaga, and Toronaga said agreed, but only if it looks like an accident. Okay, so what happens? Does she die in a bizarre samurai? It, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't say. It just. Okay. But, but Blackthorn is led to believe that it was. Uh, it was an accident. Um, <laughs> Daryl Johnston, you can listen to the audio book. I, I'm only gonna. Uh, yeah, if it's read by the guy that does the voice for Hong Kong Fui, I'm, I'm definitely in. Um, off the top of my head, off the top of my head, what really drives me crazy about the, the, this last episode, last couple of episodes, yeah. is that they is that they completely dropped from the face of the earth some character that we saw early on, like Rodriguez. What the hell happened to Rodriguez? We didn't yeah, even yeah. see the guy again. This, this, what, the, what, the, what the hell happened to the Portuguese captain of the black ship? We didn't see that at all. Like, well, why even introduce this character? That's another, that? That, that's another gripe I have with the show. To be uh, honest, uh, with the exception of the young priest, all of those characters might as well not have been in the, in, in the series. That's right. That's right. Because they really didn't have like key. They, they came and they gossiped and they, they you know, Occasionally they moaned about Anjin's character to one party or another, but they held no influence. Whereas in the 80 show, these guys were proper conniving. They were very much present. They seemed powerful. It seemed like they held held sway over certain quarters. They it felt like they had influence. Um, and they it was were entertaining. Very, yeah, and they were they were very menacing. Here they were just nothing really, uh, and uh, that is another gripe I definitely have. Yep. I was. I was waiting for them to pan out and I thought they were going to have a bit more to do because, you know, they kind of appear, well, the young priest appears fairly early in this episode. And then that was, yeah, that was it. Um, Omi's girlfriend as well, Dan Candy, saying another character that was kind of pointless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kiku just, yeah, I was going to say that too. Kiku just completely disappeared after that some point. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Leroy, your thoughts? <laughs> you guys are gonna hate me. You guys are gonna hate me. We're not gonna, we're not gonna, we don't do hate here. We don't do hate here. In so. response to all your gripes, boo hoo. Okay, I thought this was a perfect episode. I thought it ended the way it needed to end. Um, I like, in fact, this entire show, I liked it way better than the original, even though I saw the original once and it wasn't bad. I like this way better than the original. Um, but back to this episode, um, my only my only gripe is that is that Blackthorn and Fuji didn't hook up, and that Fuji decided she wants to be a nun. I was really hoping that they hook up and become husband and wife and have beautiful babies. Yeah, you were saying how much you. Great, you thought she was, but she turned out to be pretty horrible in the end. Uh, I thought so. she was cute. I thought she was very cute. Um, T. Crabby. Um, I thought she. I thought she. Out of all the women on the show, I thought she was the prettiest. So I thought she and Angela have beautiful babies. My favorite scene. Well, I got a lot of favorite scenes, but 
I thought the was the end of Yabashugi. Watching him get his just desserts brought a smile to my face. But yeah, I, I, yeah. Was, I mean, he deserved it, but I, yeah, I wanted to see. Ashido was, was the one I wanted to see get get the ending he deserved. We kind of well, just well, we already heard about we, it. We already know that he, based off the because this this based off a true story, even though it's based off the novel. The Battle of the Second, whatever you call it, actually happened in 1600, and the and the guy that Ishido is based off of dies at that battle. He got yeah, that, that, that 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 so may well be Leroy, right, right, but it's got to work. It's got to work as a property on its own. You can't say this is good, but it's even better if you go and check out the Wikipedia page because then you can find out what happened. It's <laughs> well, got look. to work as its own entity. I'm judging it purely on what's on here. Yeah, we can talk about comparisons between 1980, but my 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 ultimate scores for this film are purely for this show. Mm -hmm. in its own right and i, yeah, I don't I, think it, I don't think it delivered everything it could on the last but, last but this, this is my personal opinion i feel this episode it ended the way it needed to end and you know everything that i wanted to see happen with the exception of anjin and fuji not hooking up as husband and wife i saw it happen what, what i'm truly grateful for uh, was that um tornaga's wife no, Tornaga, Tornaga's baby was saved. He didn't die, so yeah. I was very grateful to see that. Because anyone who anyone who knows me knows that I love children. Babies are sacred to me. And you, as I mentioned earlier, as in the earlier episodes, when Fuji husband was so stupid enough that he got his own baby killed, you know that kind. Of, I mentioned that, and Darth Plato explained to me, you know, why that had to happen. So, but I, I don't like seeing babies getting killed or stuff like that. So the fact that Tornaga's baby was saved and protected, I'm truly, I was truly grateful for that. Um, the episode, the episode was good, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm probably gonna be the lone wolf on this one. But all, all you guys who are griping, especially all you guys in chat, Dan Candy, it's just a show. Boo hoo. <laughs> Get it, it's getting personal now, uh, Leroy. Don't, uh, <laughs> don't, get, don't, don't incur the wrath of chat. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I know what I'm talking about. Don't, let's hey, not talk. I, I, loved, I loved it. Um, I, to be honest with you, the worst episode of this entire show was episode five. And even that wasn't bad, entirely bad. I mean. Okay. It, well, in your yeah. opinion, in your opinion. Okay. In my All right. Opinion. All right, uh, you're, I'm afraid the sand timer has run out, Leroy. <laughs> you're gonna lose, gonna lose it. it it's, yeah. it's your it's your go. Yeah, definitely. Uh, sometimes you watch something a second time, and I do admit the first time I had a certain expectation. Watching it a second time, I actually appreciate the episode a lot more, only because I dealt with this with Gladiator Russell Crowe. I expected Maximus to have this massive half hour battle sequence. We didn't get that. Um, Star Wars Rebels came out not that long ago. We had old Obi Wan versus Darth Maul. I expected the prequel uh, fight scene didn't happen. It was a quick thirty second fight. This show, from what I read, based on the book, I didn't watch the original TV series. Everyone is asking, like you said, Lance on Google, where's the big battle sequence? And everyone says that, well, this is how the book ended, and the book doesn't have a big massive battle sequence, nor does the original eighties TV show. So even though I expected a massive battle sequence. Had they done that, would that have been true adaptation? Because I know I'm not a big Lord of the Rings book fan, but the biggest criticism with Return of the King was the whole Pelennor Fields and the whole undead army. That, that didn't happen in a book, and people felt like Peter Jackson kind of used that as a quick cop-out. So I do wonder, had we seen a big 35, 45-minute battle sequence, would that have been a, a disrespect or like bad adaptation to the book? Um. I don't know. I mean, I don't know that we need... Listen, I, I wouldn't have objected if there had been a 30-minute battle sequence. I would have been quite happy to kind of have a command tent sequence. Um, yeah. I, I, maybe not quite happy, but I, I think that would have been... I, I just... I was, You know, I just felt Toronaga's speech, good that it was. I, I, I wanted to see Ashido lose his head, really. Yeah. I, th I felt like we'd earned that vision um it might be that they might do a well you know listen if the if people are asking for it you suddenly might find that there's a season two coming and it will take the history 
further and hey if they if it's as good as this one uh, bring it on i'll have it um Amen. But, yes. um they'll I'll be in the they'll be in uncharted waters though because they'll have no book so um you know um and i think uh i think that would be quite dangerous i'd be quite happy for them also to just do season one but but it it did feel like the problem was is that the i think the tension in this show is this version is built up a lot stronger than in the 1980 version because the 1980 version is good but it's got a lot of very long-winded dialogue scenes yeah. and and the pacing is all over the place this show is a different kettle of fish it's it's like there's no waste everything is really important key to them to another scene in an episode you know everything links to something very quickly and you, you're constantly uh looking at oh yeah yeah that that's about that this is about that so mm. i think i think it raised the bar in terms of what we were owed uh also wilson wells doing the voiceover um <clears throat> at the end um is is you know the original series is a, is a very powerful thing because Orson Welles's voice is amazing. Uh, Darth tells me that Shido's actual fate was that he was buried up to his neck. People mm. mocked him, sword at his neck. He died three days later. Well, I think we should have seen that. That would have been good. That would have that would have that would have worked. I, I just feel like we were owed more of an ending with Shido's comeuppance. Yeah. Because I think I know... off the whole answer, right? Because uh, I've got my stream coming up in ten minutes. So yeah, mate. Do you want to do you, you want to plug anything before you go? Yeah, I'm doing a uh, Dead Men Don't Wear played in about uh, it's nearly ten minutes with uh, Emperor J. Goodwin. Cool. But but you're not people listening. You're not allowed to join it until at least an hour in. Uh, by the time we finish. But uh, yeah, okay. so yeah, well, what about but... any anything else, mate? Is that yeah, it? Just just give a ring right. as we head out. Yeah, I'll be doing a uh, Fallout TV reviews uh very soon i'm getting it to i've gotten some of it together and i'll be getting the rest there uh, probably tomorrow once i get a chance but uh no yeah, be before you go give us your rating out of 10 for this episode and can you give us your rating out of 10 for the show overall i'll give it a uh, six and a half out of 10 for the episode as the what? series overall I'll probably give uh, an 8 out of 10 because there is still a lot of strong stuff in there despite the letdown of the final episode. Yeah, okay. No worries, man. Have right. a good uh, stream. Say hi to Steve Martin for me. <laughs> and uh, evening, lady. Yeah, we'll, well, catch, uh, we'll catch, catch you, you up later. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank no, you cool. uh, for joining me, Leroy, and uh, play hey, and, is this, uh, is this your own channel, dude? Be one of Take care, Norman. Yeah, I'll see you. I'll see you next Tuesday, buddy, on the Nielsen Ray. Are you hosting this on your own channel or someone else's? No, he's on, no, it's on my channel. Okay. Oh, it's on your channel. Okay, cool, cool. Catch you later, All right. man. All right, buddy. I'll pop in the chat. Um, great, good old. Uh, and uh, if you want to like and subscribe, Northern's uh, links are down below. So, um, yeah, okay. Uh, in terms of. Um, uh, things that we liked about it, I guess we kind of agree on a, a fair number of those. Yeah. Um, but the chat is uh, has differing views. Drew Gordon says, I'm with Leroy. Jamalama <laughs> yeah. says, Off with Leroy's head. <laughs> so, um, I'm, I'm, I'm bring him on, Jamalama. I'm, I'm with. I'm working. Dan Candy, why am I getting called out? Indeed, Dan, <laughs> I've, I've been trying to uh, defend you there. I don't know why you're being called out. Um, yeah, so, um, but RRTNZ says what Leroy seems to understand is that why the 2024 series disrespects Blackthorn is disrespects the Japanese characters much, yeah. much, 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 much more. They are much smarter and capable in the 1980 yeah. book. I don't think I the they were in, I, I never read the book, but from what I remember from the 1980 series and from this series. The, the Japanese characters are much, much, much more intelligent, smarter, hmm. both good guys and bad guys than from what I saw in the 1980s version. I, I think they come across as more intelligent in this series, but I would also argue that's partly to do with the difference in acting style as well. Yeah. And um, we got to remember, one of the reasons why I personally like this 
the night this series better than the 1980 series that it's told from the Japanese point of view, not from Predom a white yes, savior. Yes, yes, yes. That's Predom what people need to understand. Yeah. Uh, yeah, to my knowledge, like basically from what I gather reading chat and talking to you guys the past 10 weeks is that the 80s show is basically through Black Point's Blackthorn's point of view. This is mostly Tornaga's point of view. Well, so I'm reading it wrong. Um no, I mean, the, the, yeah, this show I would say is it's like 30% Torinaga's perspective, 30% Mariko's perspective. Yeah. I'd say 15% Blackthorns and then 15% side characters. Okay. But in the, that, within that, the, 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 the 80s show is mostly Blackthorn is the main character we're following his. I would say the 80s journey. show is 50% Blackthorns. Okay perspective if not slightly more maybe even 55 60 and then you've got sort of a percentage of it is side characters and then um yeah because mariko has almost no scenes without blackthorn in that version from what i remember yeah that is true i remember that there, there were there though yeah that there, there's a, there's a couple but there's not many hmm. whereas here she's she's got a very strong narrative of her own stuff going on. So that means yeah. so a lot black of manufacturing. So does sorry, mean... Darth, say that again. Sorry, but a lot of it is manufactured. Though the relationship with Ochiba it doesn't it doesn't appear in the book. It's manufactured for the show. Right. Okay. Uh, it's, that's interesting because it's I, I like it. It's one of the, a really strong asset uh, for this. I thought. And I um, and I just want to say about Lady Ochiba. Hang on, Blue is whoa, wait up, wait up, Leroy. Sorry. Blue is next. Yeah, he oh, was. No. Gonna... The only thing I want to ask because you said that Black Thorn, he has more point of view in the, in the 80s series. So does that mean does Black Thorn get more airtime in that show and he has less airtime in this show? Yeah, yeah, way more. Okay. Way, way. It's, he gets like he's like 50% of the airtime in that show is his, is his mm. narrative. Okay. At least, if not, I would say probably higher than that. Uh, sorry, Leroy, go on. Yeah, I missed, I forgot to mention about Lady Ochi. I misjudged her because I thought. When, when, when she first appeared on the scene, I thought she was half Satan, half Jezebel. But after this episode that she basically stabbed Oshida, Oshida in the back, I'm like, oh, I was wrong about her. Yeah. Or was it the other way around? Mm. What, Ishida? I've never, Darth Plato, I've never read the book. So, and now that you mentioned that in the book Fuji dies, I really have no reason to read the book anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you should still read the book because there's loads of other characters in it that aren't even in the show. Let's consider, yeah. consider how is she going to handle the whole thing with Mariko and the confrontation over the hostages? Are they going to be released? Are they going to be held? How he held, how he handled that scene really it was why Ojiba decided to abandon him. Mm. Yeah, because she knew that Ashido had been outmaneuvered, right? So, well, the poem did the poem didn't help either. That was actually a veiled threat, right? Mm. Hmm. Just that last week, if you recall. Uh, yeah, I think actually when I watch it for the third time, I'm going to have a lot of unique. Actually, you know what? Now, now that we're at the end of the series, I, I can just go ahead and tell you now. Uh, in the book, um. The, the kid is not the Tycos. The way the way it's explained is that she went off with some other guy to uh, you know to have the kid. It wasn't the Tyco that did it, and it even describes right. what happened. Parents, she went. She, what happened was she went riding off, and she just found some random guy, and they went into the bushes, and that's how they did it. And Coronago was following her because he suspected that she was going to do something like that, and that's how it, it's, it's wow. kind of it, yeah. It's funny how the book put up this. It just spills it out at you in the book. It's really kind of funny how it does. So when you realize that and then look at the poem that was given in the last episode, I think the meaning is kind of obvious. Mm. Okay. That's and one more thing is um, I wanted to address the uh, the part about where uh, they're talking about what Blackthorn said in episode three about unless I win. I think that the showrunners of the show yeah. misunderstand the significance of that scene when Blackthorn says to Toronaga, "Unless I win." It, it, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, just go. Just you can probably find it on YouTube. Go back and look at that scene. Walk the whole scene over again, and wait for that scene. That is a pivotal moment in the meeting 
between Blackthorn and Toronaga. That is the moment. What, what, what? That was in episode two. Yeah, what, that, that, that what's, is the moment. <laughs> what's, Black, what's Blackthorn's version of winning, Darth, in his head when he says that? Unless I win? Yeah. Yeah. It's not so much Blackthorn as Toronaga. When Blackthorn says that, it impresses Toronaga that oh, this is this is outside the box thinking. Right. That's why he likes. That's why he likes Blackthorn remarks. Remember in the 1980 series, um, he gives the remark, and Blackthorn does like. Toronaga gives this a belly laugh. Like uh, he really likes that response. He likes the response because yeah, you're a man after my own heart. He doesn't say that, but that's really his reaction. Hmm. But this, I, but the but the 2024 series he doesn't seem to get that at all. But I, but but no, I get it. Darth played. I, I rem, it was in episode two when when Blackthorn said, "Unless I win," you could see Tornaga give a little smirk. So so I knew Tornaga was impressed by Blackthorn. Anything is possible. Yep. <laughs> mm. Wow, well, people in the uh, people in the chat are being slight swayed towards the uh, camp of Leroy. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Nick, so I'm just going to address this comment. Basically, what, what um, I'm um, saying is is my review of this show ultimately is purely on what I'm seeing in this show. Yes, we are we are talking about things we liked in the '80s show, better or worse. Uh, but my ultimate view and my ultimate ratings are, uh, are purely based on what this show delivered of itself, not. Um, I'm not deducting whether it was as good or as bad as the the 80 version or which bits were better, but that's just something we talk about, but I'm not basing my final um, rating on that uh, uh, in any sense. Um, yeah, okay. Well, let's... Uh, uh, Blue, you got anything else you want to add? Um, the only thing is, like, you know, you're, you're kind of mentioned the joke about the whole Bond villain thing with Tornaga and Yabushi, but... It was a bit, it was a bit like yeah. that. But I did admit, I again, the second time liking it more because, yeah, I didn't catch the fact that uh, Miracle was the Crimson Sky. And also, as Lord Toxic has said since episode one, I really didn't know where Tornaga was going because everyone, even like at one point, uh, Blackthorn apologizes. Like, you know, we didn't know what you were doing. And he's on this guy's deathbed in a sense. Like, please tell me what, what your ultimate plan is. And he just breaks down the past 10 episodes, like how masterfully this guy's like, yeah, I knew if I took my army and tried, you know, taking over the castle. I was gonna lose. So he's like, I did. I did the one thing that you know an army couldn't do. And a woman, what one woman did, what an army couldn't do, and just like mm. a miracle dying like that. I'm like, that's um, that's pretty deep. <laughs> mm, yeah. It, it's interesting that in the book, Crimson Sky actually takes place after Mariko's yeah. death, and 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 she is not Crimson that's Sky. Cool. But but I, yeah. I I think. I think that's a good change. I think yeah. making her Crimson Sky is really clever. It's 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 good. You and, know? I, and I know we break this down so many times. It's 2024. People like using, you know, the DEI stuff and words like woke. But, like, look at right there. I sent a woman to do what an army never could. Mariko is not a combat specialist. She's not mowing down 40, 50 guys. She did, in some ways, she's the most, she is, like, his most important weapon by sacrificing her life <laughs> like oh my god yeah. that, that is yeah. so deep like that that's yeah, game of thrones that, level there's no way to predict how that was yeah. going to happen though i mean yoshida could have just as easily let them all go out of the castle and then have a bunch yeah. of women ambush them like a mile from the castle well i think in yeah. Naga's case well he was but he was really really banking on ishido not letting her live and in, in the end he won you know like this was like this is somebody who's like the whole like you know playing chess when you're all playing checkers but everything from episode one from like letting black Thorn live to San Mariko to except for his son dying, but like he's been planning this entire 10 episode arc and everything at the end has come come through the way he wanted to. He had like yeah, the old remember the old fisherman. The old fisherman, that guy was a spy the entire time. And mm -hmm. him breaking down a blackthorn. Okay, I gotta tell you, I can speak English, I'm a Christian. I'm not just a simple, stupid fisherman. No, it's like Tor Tornaga has been playing this since like the opening opening scene we've seen him. Like now just it all pans together in this whole five minute monologue, and I'm like that's wow! I didn't see it. this guy's doing Emperor Palpatine level planning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, don't get me wrong; it's it, it's not that I disliked what we had with this scene, and what we had was very good. His speech is very good. It's kind of nice the way it all ties together. But I I would have liked us to maybe have had a 
two, three minutes scene with Ashido, even if that was him being defeated yeah. on the battlefield, buried up to his neck, being eaten by crabs, yeah. tortured with honey on the nose and wasps, whatever. But I just kind of, not, you know. It's something that was, was I will ask, I will ask you, nice. Lance, in the panel later on is that as much as I did want a big epic battle sequence, I love battle scenes. So far in these 10 episodes, we haven't had a big battle scene. So I do wonder if like that epic scene would have been out of place. Like as much as we didn't like Masters of the Air, at least Masters of the Air had, you know, sometimes aerial fight scenes, dialogue, aerial fight scenes. This show had never had a big battle scene. So maybe this this no. really, really does match the tone of the show because we're not we're expecting it, but like when has this show ever given us a battle scene? We've only had I, small, I, I, I but, kind of know. I kind of knew we weren't going to get it. I was, I was. Yeah, that's, that. Let's go ahead, go ahead, Lance. No, I, I mean, I, I know I was saying I, I wanted it, but I kind of knew we weren't going to get it. But I did think we would get a command tent, and I yeah. did think we would get Ashido personally getting more than a kind of a narrative comeuppance of supposition. I thought we would see something happen to him. That that yes, I did yes, comeuppance. Yeah, yeah, I'd say the, the closest thing to a battle scene this entire show showed was when was in episode three when they left osaka when they escaped out of osaka that that's that's probably it that but, that that and the ninja attack which actually yeah. was pretty weak yeah yeah and they're and both that night too yeah both at night can't see anything um yeah. game of thrones uh dop hey, uh, you guys are never satisfied aren't you <laughs> <laughs> It's almost like what Krabby Patty just said, you know, from episode one. I don't want to be Shogun. He says right there, you know better than us in your secret heart, even Shogun. Like, he, he said episode one, I don't want to be Shogun. I want nothing to do with this. Now, yeah. with, now with the finale, yeah, yeah, I do want to be Shogun. Oh, shit. <laughs> he, he's been play, manipulating everybody in this entire fucking show. I still right think now. he's an honorable guy, though. I still think oh, we're yeah, not. But just, but it just shows how good he is. Like his, remember, his, his best friend, the old guy, died. I've known this guy for 40 years. Nobody knew what he was up to but him. Mm. Like yeah. That's, that's deep. Yeah. I mean, uh, actually, the fact that Yashabi calls him out. Yeah. You know, I, that, th this line, you'll know better than us in your yep. secret heart. Because even though, yeah, it's all ta tactical with him, he's still kind of, y you know, people have basically been expendable. In the same yeah. way that to Yashubi for his own ambitions, people were expendable. I don't think one man is necessarily better than the other. Yeah. It's just that one went about things in a different, more honourable, but clever way, which kept yeah. his honour. And yeah, please tell me before I die. Yeah, why? Why tell Dead Man in the future? Like, oh yeah, damn! I remember. Yeah, but you sure you said that in episode one. And it's right there. Like even, but that that was kind of weird. A small smirk where it's like he. Yeah, you're dying. I'm, I'm he's, he's confession to so Ibushi, but he can't tell anybody he's about to die. He smiles like I he knows he won. I mean, even though we don't see it for season two, season two, it's you know, a tornado won this war. Yeah. Karma ain't in the you know what. <laughs> okay, so chat, listen up. It's time for us to uh give ratings out of ten. Yeah, what I'd like, what I'd like you to do is do two numbers. Uh the first number, the one on the left will be your rating for this episode. Uh, you put a slash after that, which will be your rating for the show overall. So, for example, if this was Drew's one, it would be eight and a half for uh, episode 10 and 10 out of 10 for the show overall. And by the way, Drew, I'm not saying that that was your final vote. It's just the way that I want it to look. So, uh, guys in the chat, you can start... Um, <laughs> You can stop uh, doing that, uh, please. Uh, put your ratings uh, in there. Sorry, uh, yeah, the mic was behind my <laughs> head momentarily there, Drew. was uh, just getting in the way of me having a shave. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, uh, I'll let my guests go first. Uh, Blue, you're at the top there. <laughs> what, are you, uh, what are you thinking? Yeah, I'll, I'll just elaborate. Yeah, episode two, didn't like as much. Second time, appreciate it. Damn sure, nine out of ten for me. The show overall, I said it before, I'll say it again 10 weeks later, my favorite show of the year. I've been looking forward to weekly discussions with you, Plato, Leroy, the entire chat. I like the weekly uh, model versus binging. It gives me more time to digest this. It's Game of Thrones without the dragons. Simple as that. And <laughs> um, we did, everybody had certain expectations, and I like that. It subverted my expectations, but in a good way. I didn't read the book, didn't see the show, so... For me, I didn't have a weekly comparison every single week. Well, the book did this, the book did this, the show did this, and that's I did that on purpose. So 
overall as a show, yeah, I mean, it's still nine and a half, nine point five for me out of ten. I'll watch it again. Loved it. If we don't get a season two, I mean, hey, but of course, not. I mean, you know what? I mean, I, I never thought I was gonna get a Beetlejuice too either. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, hey, we, you know, time will tell. It is still FX's number one show of all time. It's breaking records. I mean, you know, money, money talks, guys. So, yeah, you might be right there. We, I mean, it, it's gonna be a difficult one because people weren't contracted for a second season, so that's yeah. gonna mean a shitload of renegotiation, which I can tell you is always difficult. Yeah. Uh, but, um, uh, um. Uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I, mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it. I'm just saying, like, we all know, like, you guys all know anything to business now. You throw enough money at anything, it stuff's possible. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is true. Darth, uh, you're, uh, all right. What I'm gonna say is, um, the book is really profound in the political intrigue, the sheer weight of character interaction. Plenty of it was not directly involved with Black Thorn, that is true. Um, the novel starts off with the stranger in the strange land theme. And you learn the place, the language, the customs through the protagonist's eyes and experience. That's half the book. The other half is the infrastructure, the political story, and the character doing. And it is very intricate. But it is not a, a simple story. The 1980 miniseries is predominantly the stranger in the strange land. The political structure is given... Uh, in a very bare bone minimalist way, there is loss of content, yes. But the 80 series does capture the spirit of the novel, if you will. The series is like waddling through surf. You get your feet wet. Whereas the book is very much deep water. So I recommend, though again, I recommend the book. As for the 2024 Shogun, this series tries to do the reverse. It is rejecting the Blackthorn stranger in a strange land motif, while at the same time, it seems to me, tries to keep Blackthorn as a main protagonist. And it just seems off to me. If you're going to remove that theme, then it seems to me that you should just skip the whole Blackthorn going to Japan at all and just have him and just have him be like a selective cameo like a guy. Just have him just have him have him show up and like, oh, oh look, there's the guy from Shogun. And, and while you're at it, rename the show Shogun. I don't think this should be called Shogun. But anyway, I, that, that's not to hear that much. What the show does try to do is bring the political intrigue with more weight than in the 80s series. That's for sure. And I don't think that's a bad... This is not a prison. I don't think that's a bad thing. With with a, with a book as, as dense, as long... It's, it's what, 1,154 pages? It's, it's, it's almost as long as War and Peace. You can do one of two things. You can follow the Blackstone story or you can follow the political story. You can't do both unless you're doing like a 25 episode season. Mm. <laughs> so I don't begrudge the showrunners for doing what they're doing and making a, a, a Japanese centric, political centric show. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, Blackstone is pushed to the margin, which is why I don't think that they should have called it Shogun. If you want to do a story about this, by all means, but don't call it Shogun. But in yes, sorry. so in doing that, the political structure of the story is purposefully changed. Again, not necessarily a bad thing. I already mentioned the Okuba and Mariko connection is um, well, it's done in an astroturf kind of way, but it's not Shogun. Uh, the whole thing about Nagakado, the 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 idiot son, and how he died that that whole thing is going to alien to the book. It again. It, it, and the uh, trying to insert some of the last samurai theme into the like like the the standoff with Blackthorn and uh, Yabu. What the what, what was the point of that scene? It, they seem to be injecting this stuff. I'm not sure what they're trying to do with it. Um, at times, 24 21st, the 2024 vision version is very sanitized. They give an example of something that's sanitized. When Blackthorn goes to prison, they just simply throw him in there. In the in the 1980 version, they they take him through the gate, and he's looking around. There's crucified victims all around him. Sure. This show, and you that. don't see that at all. You don't see that here at all. It's completely sanitized. Yeah, that that bit was. I would have liked to have seen that. Actually, that would that could have been really good, especially with CGI. You could have had like yeah. miles of them. You know, a friend of mine said oh, that in one the, the whole boiling alive scene was that more graphic than this one. I heard that part. That yeah, was yeah. That, that, that was, was that was. I remember the boiling. 
a live mm -hmm. scene in the original series, mm -hmm. and this one was more graphic than the original series. Okay. True, true. But by sanitize, I don't mean um, um, shy about violence. I don't mean sanitize in that respect. I mean sanitize in the sense that they want to they want to put the Japanese in the best possible light. Mm -hmm. and that is that they're not anti-Christian. Yeah, right. That's what I, that's what I mean by sanitize. Now, do you want me to give a rating? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, for the episode, I'm gonna say sorry, but I'm gonna give it a seven. It just, this episode just drives me crazy. Uh, I, as for the series overall, uh, I'm going to give it two ratings for a standalone series. I'll say it's an 8.5. I think it's a strong series. I think it's the best series I've seen since the expanse. Probably. I love, I, I do like the series. Um, from, from much of the, re Lance could explain it much better than I could. He already has it in the episode. So really just rewatch, just rewatch the parts of the show where Lance is talking. I agree with everything he just said. Uh, my the other half of it is how do I rate this series compared to the 1980 version in the book? In that sense, I'm going to give it a seven. That's not a fail, but I think it I think it departs from ways that I think they just are not comfortable as a as a lifelong fan of this of this book and this and the original series. Okay, all right, uh, Leroy, I'm uh, uh, spotting the sand timer now. Oh, shut up, Lance. <laughs> I'm going to give it a rating first. Um, the episode, episode 10, I'm going to give it a 10 out of 10. I thought that's fair. 10 out of 10. Um, the show itself, 10 out of 10. Why? Because this show, 10 times better than, than, the, than the 1980s version. I've never read the book, and I'm I don't think I'm going to be able to now that now that on um, Darth Plato said it's like over 1,100 pages. Huh. I haven't even read the Bible in its entirety. Okay, so I don't don't expect me to read a book that thick. So, um, but I'm trying to be as unbiased as I can. What I love about this show is that it's completely from a Japanese point of view about the japanese japanese history and it's even though it's based off a book the characters are based off actual people of, and actual events that actually happened i'm speaking as a history buff so that's why i give the book i'm not the book the series 10 out of 10 even the worst episode which i thought was episode five i only get i couldn't rate that lower than 8.8 .8 out of 10 which in my opinion just goes show how good this show is and i tell i i just I told a friend of mine, a good friend of mine I grew up with last week, he just watched it for the first time, binge watched up to episode six. And he said, Leroy, you're right. This show is good. And my, I have an aunt who's seen the Richard Chamberlain version. And I told her about this one. And I, I, I don't know if she's seen it yet, but um, this show is so good. It deserves an Emmy and a Golden Globe. Now, Here's what concerns me, um, and I don't know if it has anything to do. Well, it does have anything to do with the show, but I've said it before. If this show, if the Emmys and the Golden Globes do not, not just nominate this show, but they, if they, if not one person from the actors to the directors to the whoever, everyone who worked on the show does not get an award, the only, then the only, the only reason for that is pure racism because a show as good as this that's told from the ethnic point of view which it's about you and and the acting the CGI there is no excuse why this show should not be when be nominated and win an Emmy or Golden Globe I mean that I have I'd say I don't mean to be a <laughs> an activist or a, or a spoil sport, but that's that's how I see it because I've seen so many good movies, good, like, for example, Killers of the Flower Moon. I was very upset that movie got passed up for an Oscar. And I, I'm i terrified that, that they'll probably do the same thing with Shogun, 
but not one person will win a Golden Globe or an Emmy. I know it's a miniseries, so you can't give it a miniseries an Oscar, but this show definitely deserves an award from from what they've done and all the hard work they put into. I'm done. Excellent, and you you still have a minute on the on the clock, so yeah, you, you, you do well. Then. Encore, encore. Let's uh, let's have a look at some of the uh, comments in the chat here, and if you haven't given it a rating, you do a poll, Lance. Please do. Uh, yeah, actually, I could create a poll, couldn't yeah. I? I hadn't thought of that. Because I mean, um, I one for the episode, one for the series. Yeah. Dan Candy, I enjoyed the Shogun recaps. Well done, fellas. You will make it entertaining. We do our best, uh, sir. We do our best. Um, We've got some other ratings here. I'm gonna I'm gonna deal with those. Uh, so first of all, we have uh, Jamalama um, seven and a half for this episode, ten point nine to ten. Okay, I'm not quite sure what that means, but uh, you can only go as far as ten um, out of ten. So uh, I think he enjoyed the show. I think he made nine out of ten for the episode. okay. Krabby Patty uh, seven out of ten for this episode, nine out of ten for the season. Dan Candy, was I entertained? Kinda. Well, I don't know. Let's. Uh, let's. What do you think? Oh, great here. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? There we go. Exactly. Oh, great, yeah. Ollie Reed. There. Let's get a better clip. Uh, was I disappointed? Yes. Episode uh, and season overall six, a so six overall from uh, oh, you Dan Candy. <laughs> <laughs> You're incurring Leroy's wrath. Um, Drew Gordon, eight and a half for 10 for the episode, nine out of 10 for the show, closer to 9.5 than an 8.5. Mm. Very good. John Travolta says 9.5 out of 10, and overall, the best thing I've seen in years, 10 out of 10. John, when are we going to see you in your own samurai ninja pick? Good, uh, good work, John. Yeah, so uh, six for the finale, eight and a half overall. I probably won't rewatch like I've done for a lot of the OG series. Listening to you guys made this entertaining. The audio book was great. Took me back to my prison years. Okay. <laughs> and yeah. uh, we got any other ratings? Uh, hashtag sand timer. Absolutely. We, we that didn't make that a mandatory thing. <laughs> um, I completely understand Darth. I feel similar about the Fallout show. A couple of normies might like it, but the fans see the problems. Um, I am a big fan of Fallout, mate. I, I've got some of my facts mixed up on that, but I played the the um, the Las Vegas one from New Vegas, beginning yeah. to end. I did New Vegas, yeah. The did, Hello I, Four, but, dude. I call it Las Vegas every time. That's never going to change. Um, <laughs> How dare you? From beginning to end, I activated the big rover army with the little guy inside the pod, which is kind of near one of the endings. Mm. You've got the Battle of Hoover Dam. I did that. Too much kind information. Of, yeah, the thing kind of ends after the Battle of Hoover Dam. Um, yeah. But, you know, there's all these side quests that you do uh, on the way there, and there's loads of other stuff. It, I loved it. It was great, man. It was, it was so Yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually a fan of the, of the Fallout series myself. I actually don't just like the, the TV show. Uh, I know that people are pointing out their problem with the timeline, but I can't imagine that the problems are so bad that it completely breaks the timeline. I think you just need to look at the show as its own thing, but it's it. it I think it does a good job of emulating the. Um... Yeah, I, I, I'm fine with the series, and I was a fan of the games. I played three Fallout and four. I mean, by Fallout, I mean uh, New Vegas. I love New Nick's, Vegas. Nick's who's dressed like a ninja on his avatar is giving us his rating without even seeing the episode. More like a five out of ten. It sounds like. Eight out of ten for the whole season. I'll watch it this weekend. Uh, well, you can always come back and tell us. Um, is this what, what was this? L O T. Is that Lord of the Rings? Can't be. No. Um, it's all more toxic about the Killers of Flower Moon movie. Oh, Killers of Flower. Okay. Yeah. All, right, all right. Waiting for Quentin's Ninja Script, sci-fi <laughs> Ninja Script. That is a film I would definitely see uh, for sure. The Platinum Edition of New Vegas with the four expansion missions. Is really hard to get now, hmm. and CEX sell it for thirty quid second hand. Yeah, that's the one where it's kind of the thing's reimagined and everything's slightly different. You've got an alien ship at one point stuck on the side of the mountain, and hmm. you can go and talk to the aliens. I haven't played it, but my my mate was playing that version of it, and he kept telling me to go and look for things, and I go and look for them on the map, and they weren't there. And it was only then that we realised we were playing two slightly different versions. So. Um, 
Okay. Well, coming up, we've got quite a lot coming up, guys. Uh, we have got, uh, there it is all on the text. We've got actor Damon Herriman coming in for an interview on Saturday, 9 p.m. UK time, 4 p.m. East Coast. I think it'll be 1 p.m. in uh, L.A. or uh, West Coast. Uh, he is the star of Justified, Mr. In Between, a whole load of other shows. Uh, he was also Charles Manson in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and on, uh, and on was it Mind Hunters? Is that what it was, the FBI show? Mind Hunter. Mind Hunter. Uh, so you're going to want to check that out. I'm a big fan of his. Uh, on Sunday, we're doing our first Band of Brothers, episode one retrospective. Going to be showing behind the scenes stills from every episode. We're going to be looking at the scripts. So it's going to be quite different from any other Band of Brothers stream you've seen. And uh, I will have a guest who's worked on every episode on the show with me. Uh, and of course, don't forget, I interviewed Alan Tompkins, who was a very close friend of mine, who was also the art director on Band of Brothers. So we're going to see if we can get a few extra bits uh, there uh, via his lovely wife. So uh, plenty of stuff to come, uh, plus all the usual stuff, uh, Nielsen ratings on Tuesday and uh, so on. Blue, what you got coming up? Uh, tomorrow, myself, more toxic. Uh, we, we're going to check out the new Zendaya film. Will it be any good? I have no idea, but we'll find out. And if anybody, if like, you know, Leroy and when chat Plato, I'm taking my kid. I, I'm looking forward to seeing the Mummy 25th anniversary. My son's 16. He never seen it in theaters. And boy, I, I love these re-releases. Uh, I love I love the mummy and the mummy returns. I wasn't feeling the third one though. Oh, no, nah, uh, there was so much behind the scenes with that. Like Jet Li had scheduling issues, and but Brendan says he wants to do a fourth mummy, and right now, why not? He's too he's too fat to do that though. He can he can drop I, down. I, I'm not, I'm not be, I mean, he I'm can not he bad. can he can play the mummy in the fourth one. He can be like uh, he can awake from a tomb. Um, yeah. yeah, a little toxic. If only we knew a YouTuber who's been a paratrooper. Mm -hmm. oh, well. <laughs> I have about fifty friends who've been paratroopers, uh, but uh, are, you, yeah. are, you talk, are you talking about the movie with Tom Cruise? Oh, that movie's a masterpiece. <laughs> uh, we're talking about the original <laughs> one from Brandon Fraser. That, yeah. The one with Tom Cruise wasn't all that good. Um, Leroy, you got, Leroy, you got anything you want to plug quickly? Oh yeah, my mummy. <laughs> yes. Um. Good. I just finished my newest novel, The Frontier, Book Two. Uh, it's called The Great Divide. According to my publisher, it will be out early May in Kindle. Follow the the paperback will follow it. Um, Lance, I just I already on Facebook. I sent you the I sent you a, a copy of the first book as well as the second. Oh, you, you sent so, me an actual uh, copy. Yes, yes. I told you, Leroy. I don't know how to read. How many uh, times? Um, <laughs> Uh, Wait, no, I'll, I'll, I'll give it. I, I, I haven't got a lot of time to read books right now. I'll right. be honest, because I've just been given a new script writing job. Um, so but, uh, and it's on uh, a deadline. Uh, but I appreciate it, and I, I'll see what I can do. No problem. Uh, can I show the? Can I share the image of your? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. Okay, there we go. I'll, I'll share that. Just give me a second. Other than that, I'm going to be taking a. I'm going to take a, like at least a month break from writing before I start on the third book. That's a good and, idea. Yeah, I already have. I already have a title. For the third book, I'm going to call it Soaring Eagle Woman," and yeah, I haven't started. I haven't written out the summary yet, but the plan is the main villain is going to be a warrior woman who wants to count coup on the main character. Problem is, the main character, whose name is Lazarus Buchanan, he does not believe in violence. He's a he, he believes in chivalry. He does not believe in violence towards women or making war on women at all so his chivalry is going to be tested because Just make sure uh she's got some flaws lee right uh, don't make her all powerful and uh all of well that this is a western so it's it's set in the fur trade but I'll, i've already talked to some of my, my some of my native friends that i went to school with to get some information and also sort of some advice and permission because the last thing i want to do is misrepresent yeah, yeah no sure i want to do right because one one thing about my books is that I try to write from the native point of view, even though the main character is white. I try to have the tribes represented as historically as accurate as possible during the time during the time that these that these stories take place. 
I, I, I understand. Just make sure that your characters have flaws is all I'm saying. Uh, oh, of sure, course. Make sure the Indians even have flaws, you know, uh, drinking too much fire water, whatever. Uh, Darth. Before the fire water comes to the West, though. <laughs> okay. Darth, what have you got coming up? Anything you want to plug? And can you tell us the story behind the tiger on your mat uh, that's attached to the wall behind you? <laughs> the what about what? You've got, uh, you've got on the wall behind you, there's a big tiger on your wall. There you go. War. Yeah, what's, what's, up, what's going on with that? It looks like a carpet that's attached to the wall. Well, it's, not actually, it's, it's not actually mine, but uh, it, it just happens to be in view. Uh, okay. it, wasn't some, it wasn't something that I would... Uh, I wouldn't, I'm not trying to have, like, gravitas on it. I, 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 feel like, I feel like you can tell us the story behind its origins next time. Uh, yeah, there it is. Okay. Uh, anything well, okay. you want to plug? Yeah, 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 yeah. The last guy that interrupted me on YouTube, I fed to this tiger. How ah. that first story? Okay. <laughs> his, his his feet are still at the uh, bottom. Um, <laughs> got anything you want to plug? No. Okay. Not unless, not unless you got something coming on that I don't know about. Uh, no, not at the moment. So right, then, um, we'll, then we'll play it by ear. So just to remind everybody, in addition to doing the Band of Brothers. Breakdown from Sunday onwards, eight o'clock UK time. Uh, I've also got Dale Die coming on, who of course was the military advisor on Band of Brothers, Saving Private Ryan, Platoon. Oh my God, I could reel off his credits. Last of the Mohicans, there's so many things he's worked on. He's also an author. Uh, he's also an actor. Um, uh, he's done loads of stuff. He's also been developing his own film project for ages. Runs Warriors Inc. Uh, I have to work around his schedule. So he is coming on at five o'clock UK time. Um, so it's it's a it's a much earlier stream uh, than normal. But you know how military men like to get up at the crack of dawn and get going. So uh, that's what it's all about. So that's it from all of us. Thanks for tuning in for this um, Shogun Mega Stream. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's mainly been fun because the show's been good, and um, despite my uh gripes about this episode I, I will say overall for me the show is still an eight and a half out of ten uh this episode is i, I want to watch it a third time because uh darth has uh given me some perspectives i want to check that out um i'm uh, gonna so watch the entire season currently it's, it's currently it's seven out of ten for me this episode but um we'll 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 see uh dan my next gaming stream will probably be where are we now i might do one tomorrow um i might do one early tomorrow evening before open bar begins uh and it will be continuing um exploring the fabled lands which is the gaming book series uh choose your own adventure book series but it's an open world one so it's very mm. different i try i tried to jump from book one to book four promptly got thrown in irons and found myself on a slave ship so using my unique time um, machine device I decided I had. I quickly teleported back a few options and decided not to go to book four, realizing that my character was probably not powerful enough to uh, take that particular route at that particular time. It's a bit like Fallout, you know, going roaming down the wrong path when you haven't done all those little missions that make you a li little bit more powerful. Um, and here's a Fallout guide uh, from Blue Collar Loser for yeah. Fallout fans. Thanks Tom for putting tomorrow. That in. Tomorrow's the free update for everybody. So. So it's a free update. Uh, yeah. Just 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 talk to us about that quickly before we go. I just said the game came out um, nine years ago, and anybody who yeah. owns a copy from PlayStation, Steam, whatever, it's a free update to match the current graphics, plus a couple uh, free side quests. And hey, if they want to make a, a ten year old game look modern for free, why not? That, that's an update of Fallout Four, is that right? Yes. And said, thanks to the show, they one thing the entire series they're breaking records. I mean, people the sales are up like 250% the past two weeks. So, hey, the whole new generation of Fallout fans, yeah. I will I'll look forward to uh checking out. Uh, I'm gonna get, I think I'm gonna start playing Fallout 4 again. I think I do have it for my console, so I might just get back on there and do the update through there. That's it from us, guys. Thanks so much for the chat, thanks for your ratings and so on. Yeah. Always, always a pleasure to be joined by uh, John Travolta. Um, Last ago, I just want to say it's been truly an honor and fun talking with you guys. Um, especially you, Darth Plato. You, you, who knows? I remember when we talked about the first episode. You kind of 
corrected me or educated me on how things were during that time. I want to thank you for that. Lance, thank you for inviting me on here. Um, oh, my I, pleasure. And Blue Cloud Loser, you're the best. You guys are the best, man. Thanks, Thanks buddy. Uh, listen, no, man. Yeah, th th this is where uh, Lance says, uh, let's talk price. <laughs> let's talk what? Uh, we talk, let's talk price. Um, I really appreciate that, buddy. And uh, a long, long time ago, at the very beginning of my channel, I did a top 10 uh, Westerns uh, stream, but we had all kinds of technical problems with the guy I was co-hosting it with. I think I'm going to do, I'm going to do top 10 Westerns again. So if I do, Leroy, you'll definitely be on there. Uh, I would I'd be honored. That's I, grew it from, up, I grew up watching Westerns. No, pro, I know you do. Yeah. That's it from the Outcast Creative. Do come back mm. and join us on Saturday at 9 p.m. UK time for the Damon Harriman interview. Until then, don't forget to tell the people that you care about, that you love them. And unlike Blue Collar, try not to down an entire bottle of vodka. Every <laughs> day. Yeah, we'll see you again soon. Yeah.